It is an honor and pleasure to help extend some dialogue today about one of the most critical responsibilities in both building and district leadership, and that's retaining quality professional educators. Let's face it, we can and should do more to retain quality professional educators in Kansas. You agree? No doubt about it. But knowing how to do more in the way of retaining teachers is tough. It is an area in which Dr. Ingersoll has put his time, energy, and effort. His research and expertise helped shed light on the multifaceted challenge of retaining quality teachers. It's more than making sure people just stick around. It's support, it's engagement, and it's the celebration of teachers as game changers, impact makers, and in many cases, lifesavers. As a building principal, I need help in supporting, engaging, and celebrating the teachers that commit to serving in our schools. Thus, it is with significant urgency and honor that I introduce Dr. Richard Ingersoll. He's here today to help redesign our retention efforts in Kansas so that teachers are included, engaged, elevated, and celebrated. Kansans can retain high quality professional educators. So let's warmly welcome Dr. Ingersoll to help extend this important conversation. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Just flew in from Philadelphia. So, as Paul mentioned, I do research on teachers and the teaching occupation and teacher supply and demand, and I've been doing this the last couple decades. And I, I thought I would start with a few words on my biography and how I came to studying these issues. I was a high school teacher for a number of years, and I first taught in Western Canada. That's a whole story how I got there after college, some kind of adventure. And I taught, in, I taught in school in Western Canada, and then I moved back to the Eastern US, Pennsylvania and Delaware, that's where I grew up. And I taught in both public and private schools in Pennsylvania and Delaware. And when I moved back, I was really had a comeuppance. I was taken aback, I was surprised, I was confused, I was startled. Because the job, the teaching job, put aside students for a minute, the teaching job in both public and private schools in Delaware and Pennsylvania was very different than what I'd encountered in Canada. And I'm very sorry to say this, but on any kind of measure or indicator I could give you, it wasn't as good as a job as, a job as Canada, the jobs in the States. Whether it was the salaries or whether it was this thing called respect, or the student discipline problems. When I taught high school, student behavioral discipline problems, that was half your job. That was a very big issue to sort of stay on top of that. And there was all these problems plaguing teachers. Now, of course, as a teacher, you're quite isolated. You don't even know what's going on in the rest of your school, much less in other schools and other counties in the state or other states. And so I wondered, I was puzzled. like. What, did I just sort of, did I get jobs in particularly poorly run schools? Was that the issue? Or what's the job like, the teaching job like in other places in the United States? And are these same problems that plagued us in those particular schools, are those widespread? How widespread? And how does the US, how does the teaching job compare to other countries like Canada? Well, in any event, I eventually quit. Uh, I was one of those non-retention, although I taught for a number of years, and I got a PhD in sociology, and I've been trying to answer these questions ever since. And I study the problems that plague the teaching occupation, and I did learn that no, it's not the same everywhere. My school is a little different. However, a lot of these problems are widespread across the country, and some other countries too, but not all countries. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the research I've been doing really over the last 15, 20 years on this the teacher shortage crisis. This whole issue, of why, why do we have so much difficulty in this country? And this is a perennial ongoing issue. There's nothing new about shortages. What's, what's behind it? What can the data tell us? What's, what sort of, what's the source of this problem? 
It's interesting, one of my doctoral students did an online search, and it turns out that almost every president since Eisenhower at one point or another gave a speech on teacher shortages and what to do. In other words, it's not an easy issue. Or it's not, an, it's not a new issue, and it's not an easy issue, this ongoing thing. Well, as we've heard so many times, the standard conventional wisdom goes like this. Increase in student enrollments, increase in teacher retirements, these two big demographic trends, and they're colliding, and we simply don't produce enough teachers. And so we have dozens, uh, particularly in fields like math and science and special education, and so we have dozens of initiatives, Kansas probably has some, all designed to bring more people into teaching, all under, uh, operating under the assumption that we don't make enough. We have these supply side shortages. We have student loan forgiveness. We have housing assistance. We have signing bonuses. Some districts recruit overseas. I was talking to some people in Baltimore. They recruit teachers from the Philippines. Turns out that's a very expensive rec recruitment initiative. <laughs> And does it, and these are all these these are all worth these are all completely worthwhile. I mean, who could be against trying to get bright people to come into elementary secondary teaching? Unfortunately, however, none of these initiatives have, nor will they, the data tell us, fix the problem. They simply alone will not do it. They haven't done it, they won't do it. And I've come to the conclusion from the data doing this research that we have something of a wrong diagnosis, wrong set of prescriptions. That the source of these problems of shortages isn't entirely or solely or primarily out there in these big demographic trends. Rather, they're in here in the sense of how schools run and operate and uh, how they're managed. And that I've come to the conclusion that until we recognize that and sort of look at how we can redo the way schools are running and managed, we're never going to solve these teacher shortage problems. So a quick word about my data. These are national data. It's called the Schools and Staffing Survey. It's a huge survey of teachers and principals done in all the states, including Kansas. They've been, we have 25 years of data, which allows me to look at big picture. By the way, these data are publicly available, and the survey is large enough that you can break it down by state, and so Kansas could do that. Because today, I'm going to be presenting big picture. And so, of course, one question that's going to come up for all of you is, is this true for Kansas too? To what extent does Kansas mirror the picture that I'm going to be presenting for the nation? And I can't answer that, you can. So, well, what, what do the data tell us? First, the data tell us that yes, it's true, there's been an increase in students in this country, there's been an increase in teachers, there's been an increase in teacher retirements, demand for teachers has gone up, and the size of the teaching force has gone up. And most importantly, the data tell us, yes, it's true, there's significant numbers of schools out there that have trouble filling their openings, you know, at the end of any given summer, with qualified people. There's shortages. And this slide tries to capture sort of the most concrete measure I, I have of shortages. What do these data, data tell us? So this is secondary schools across the country, and mathematics is at the top. And the red bar tells us that's the percentage of secondary schools, and this is the 15-16 school year. I've got to stop turning around like that. The 15-16 school year, and it tells us that something just under half of the secondary schools in the country had an opening that were trying to hire at least one person in mathematics. And then the yellow bar tells us the percentage of all the secondary schools that had serious problems filling those positions. And so that's something uh, between a third and a half of all the schools that had math openings had difficulty. All right, so let's go down to the bottom, social studies. Almost an equal number of percentage of schools had some openings in social studies. You know, this would have appeared in midsummer or something like that. But a very tiny percentage had serious problems filling them. I think it's 3%. So what the data tell us is there, there's two takeaways from this. First of all, there's huge differences amongst fields and to what extent there's shortages. And we kind of know that. We expect that. But the second thing is that not all schools have these difficulties. 
In any given case, it's a minority. It's not small potatoes, it's, it's significant numbers of schools, but we need to sort of isolate and define where the problem is. It's not everybody at all. So in the case of Philadelphia, you have the city school district clamoring they have shortages 10 minutes away across the city line in an affluent district, they'll laugh at you. They'll say, we have a waiting list three miles long in all fields to get into our school. Sort of surplus and shortage side to side in the Philadelphia situation. So this helps us identify the extent of the problem. It's not all fields, it's not all schools. But it's, but it's something. It's significant numbers out there. But the second big issue, and Debbie was talking about this, is the data tell us that the problem is not primarily shortages in the sense that we make too few teachers, even in mathematics and science. Rather, the problem is that we, learn, we lose too many long before retirement. At the beginning of any given school year, the vast majority, the data tell us, of openings that schools are trying to hire are simply to fill spots that were vacated several months before at the end of that prior school year. Turnover is the issue here. It's a big issue. So there's nothing wrong with bringing more people in there, but if we don't retain them, we have a problem. In other words, the problem isn't solely shortages, it's also turnover, and so hence the solution can't simply be recruitment. That's a fine thing to do. It also has to include retention. It turns out that elementary secondary teaching is a high turnover, a high quit, a high attrition line of work. And in this slide, we tried to compare it to a number of other occupations and professions. These are, again, national data. And this is where the data set took the college class of 1993 and followed them for 10 years. And so we take this large data set, and people fanned out into a lot, a lot of different types of work. And then 10 years later, how many were still in that occupation? And teaching is somewhat in the middle. And of course, I apologize to those in the back if the font is too small. But at the top, we have secretaries and child care workers and paralegals and prison guards. All of them have higher attrition rates, that's people getting out of the line of work entirely, than does teaching. On the other hand, and this somewhat surprised me, teaching's a little bit higher than nursing and police as far as attrition goes. And that surprised me. I'm kind of assuming that police, for instance, is high stress work. I know nothing about it. I haven't studied the police occupation. I'm, but I'm assuming it's high stress. I'm assuming it would have relatively high quit rates compared to other lines of work. Well, teaching's actually a little bit higher. The attrition of teaching is much higher than a lot of those traditional professions law, architecture, engineering, et cetera. I don't have it in these data, but we've compared professors, academics versus teachers. The attrition rate of teachers is about double that of professors. And then at the very bottom, a very low attrition line of work. I have no idea why, I've never studied this, is pharmacy. Apparently, people that go into pharmacy, they do not quit. It has excellent retention, and maybe someone should study that and find out what is the, uh, well, I don't know. What is the reasons for the very high retention in pharmacy? And maybe some of you has been a pharmacist in your past lifetime and can fill us in. So, so teaching, it's not the highest attrition, but it's a relatively high quit line of work. But the other thing that's almost always forgotten and not recognized about the teaching occupation, elementary, secondary teaching, is that it's huge. It is huge. According to census, teaching is the largest occupation in the US. There's over twice as many teachers as nurses, which is another large one. There's five times as many <coughs> teachers as either professors or lawyers. It's gigantic. Now, that's a whole other story. I mean, somehow, we've never been able to replace the classroom teacher. I mean, think of this. You study, I, I study a lot of other you know, comparisons, other occupations and professions. For instance, in farming, through technology, and you Kansans would know this better than I, you know, the, the statistics are that a farmer now produces something like 50, 100 times what a farmer in 1910 did. You know, increase in productivity through technology. And so we can have produce more with fewer farmers. And then there's, I'm sure there's mixed consequences of that. 
But somehow we've never been able to do that in the education industry. There's tons of experiments out there, you know, through technology and distance education and online, et cetera, but somehow you still need that teacher in front of those students for it to work. And so one of the results of this is it's a gigantic, it's a gigantic workforce, the teaching force. It's very, very large. And it's a very large, put these two data points together, very large teaching force and very, quite high levels of turnover or attrition. And I've tried to capture that in this slide. So this is the 2011-2012 school year. Again, the national picture, and that yellow arrow on the left is all those teachers that were hired into schools at the beginning of that year. And that's something over a third of a million. And then, and then that orange bar on the right is all those that left their buildings 10, 12 months later. Notice it's larger. It's too small for me to see from here, but it's over 500,000. So what these data tell us that in this 10, 12 month period, almost a million teachers, over a quarter of the nation's largest occupation, were in job transition moving into, between, or out of schools. The term we use to describe this kind of scenario in any line of work is the revolving door. A great, great deal of job transition moving into, between, or out of schools. Now note, there's two components here of turnover I'm including. There's those who quit teaching altogether, but there's also who, those we call movers who move between different schools or districts. Maybe it's within a state, maybe it's cross state. It's not just those who quit teaching altogether. Now that's what we call a research statistic that I've decided to, both those flows out I've included here. The movers and the leavers both. And often researchers don't do that. They say, well, there's no sense counting those who move between schools because, you know, they're still in the system. There's no net sh loss here. There's no net, they're not contributing to shortages. And that makes total sense, of course, from an overall systemic perspective, what we call the level of analysis. However, from the school perspective, from the principal's perspective, it doesn't really matter whether your math teacher is quitting teaching to become a banker or a salesperson or a surveyor or whatever, or whether they're moving to another school 15 minutes away. They're a part of your staffing problem. Furthermore, the data tell us that the m teacher movements between schools and districts are what we call asymmetric. They're not equal. Some schools and districts teachers want out of, and others teachers want into. So we are able to quantify this. The flow of teachers from poor to not poor schools, and sometimes that's urban to suburban, but not always, is four times the reverse, the flow of teachers from not poor to poor. And so there's very good reasons to count both the movers and the leavers. They're all part of this larger sense of churn and flux which characterizes this line of work. This is a revolving door occupation. Now, we need to recognize that not all this turnover is bad by any means. I mean, after all, there's some teachers we'd like it if they moved on. <laughs> some teachers aren't very good at it. And furthermore, all of us change jobs and careers in our lifetime. It's sort of part of life. All the turnover is not bad by any means. This is something long recognized by those who study employee turnovers in general. So in business schools, I have colleagues that study employee, you know, all the pros and cons and costs and consequences. Sometimes they'll get very fancy consulting contracts with, say, the insurance industry. Could they quantify the costs of employee turnover in the insurance industry? Because management wants to know. There's a recognition that some degree of employee turnover is good, and you want to promote it, and you're going to bend, you would like your lower performers to move on. On the other hand, there's a general recognition that high levels of employee turnover are not cost-free. This is long recognized in corporate sector until recently, as far as I could see, not recognized at all in the educational sector. Almost as if 
this revolving door of teachers has been cost free. It has not been at all. So, you know, some levels are natural and positive. High levels aren't. In this next slide I've just listed, we have a growing body of research trying to identify what are the costs and consequences of the high levels of turnover in teaching. In my own work, I've identified that one of the consequences is it's a big factor behind the teacher shortages. We have a couple studies showing now that urban schools that have a chronic revolving door, this distinctly hurts student achievement. We have a lot of research showing that if you have a revolving door, it really makes it hard to offer a cohesive, have a sense of community in your building. You're constantly having new faces coming in. You're constantly having old faces leaving or not so old faces leaving. And then finally, there's a recognition that we have a couple studies now that have quantified this, that it's not cost free money wise. If you're a principal, and you have 20% of more of your full-time teachers leaving each and every year, you know that actually takes quite a bit of time to just sort of feed that revolving door. So there's a general recognition or a growing recognition that this is a problem in this line of work and it's not cost free. And it's important to recognize those costs because as you might guess, the rate at which the revolving door revolves is not even. Some types of teachers leave at far higher rates than other types of teachers. And some types of schools have far more turnover than other types of schools. And amongst the highest rates of turnover are amongst beginning teachers. So these are national data and we calculated these a while back and they got into the media and you may have heard this, that of all those that come into teaching in five years, 40 to 50% are gone. That, that dipped a little during that recession after 09. As far as we can see, it's bounced back up. And then after five or six years, those remaining are more increasingly likely to stick around. They've decided they're going to stay. Very high quit rates in those first few years. And of course, one of the costs here is that you're losing a lot of people before they've had a chance to really get good at it. It takes a while to learn all the many skills and to get better at being a good teacher. High rates in the beginning of teaching. Then, as you won't be surprised by this slide, there's also huge differences amongst different types of schools in their annual turnover rates. And these are, again, national picture. And they tell us in this particular year, uh, the average is about 15%. You lose about 15% of your teachers on average each year. But that varies dramatically. So that second bar is large suburban, more affluent schools, and they're losing 10, 11% a year, which is close to actually a lot of other occupations and professions. Annual people leaving the building. At the bottom, we see small urban poor schools over two and a half times the rate. So on average, 26%. Gosh, each and every year, if this is chronic, you're losing over a quarter of your teachers. I mean, that's, that's a very fast revolving door. One of the consequences is you end up with a very young staff in that building because you're, you know, your, your most senior veteran might be someone in their fourth year. So large differences amongst types of schools in the turnover rates. And this brings us to what I think is the really big question. It's the why question. Why is it that turnover is so high in teaching? And more specifically, why is it that some schools have so much more of it than do other schools? And to me, this is the important question because if we don't get the diagnosis down, we'll never get the prescriptions right. I mean, what's behind this? Is it as simple as salaries? Well, we'll see. It's, no, it's not as simple as salaries. And salaries is a difficult one. I'll return to that in a minute. So what I'm going to present, this is we've, wor we've been working data on this 
many different types of data to get at this why, to answer that question. What is it? That's important. And what I'm going to present are a little bit of what we call self-report data. Teachers that departed their school, we identify them in the survey, and they are asked why. It's quite similar often to what the exit interviews that are common in corporate America. Employees leave and you ask them why. It's maybe an interview, it might be a questionnaire, it might be a focus group. There's also, there is always what we call validity questions. That is, if someone's leaving, they may not feel comfortable being frank. They may be looking for, you know, a positive recommendation or something. There's always questions there. Are your employees that departing really going to tell you why? In this case, it's this anonymous private national paper and pencil survey. We have some confidence in what the teachers tell us particularly because it's large, there's 50,000 teachers in this sample. Here's what they tell us. All right, top bar. I, I left that school because I wanted to retire. This is the smallest bar of all. That's an interesting finding. We have heard again and again and again that we have this graying hair, like me, we have this aging teaching force, and this is one of the big factors behind the shortages. It's a piece here, but it's a relatively small piece, and that's important. Less than 20%, less than a fifth. By the way, you'll notice some of you that these percentages add up to more than 100. Did I make a mistake? No, it turns out that often we have more than one reason why we depart from a work site, a job, an employment, or, you know, a a job. So, and usually teachers, even if retirement's one of their main reasons, quite often they'll give a second reason too, or a third. The second bar there, school staffing actions. This is about a fifth. This is, this includes layoffs, terminations, school closings, school reorganizations, and voluntary transfers, all those types of things, which are maybe more common in large urban school districts that, you know, there'll be school reorganizations or closings or whatever. And that's about a fifth. The third bar, I departed from my school for family or personal reasons. These are, I had health concerns. I needed to care for elderly folks. I wanted to raise babies. My spouse moved to another state. Things like that, that are sort of part of life. You're going to have employees leave any job, any workplace, any firm or outfit for these kinds of reasons. And these represent 44%. That's a large chunk. I, I wouldn't think that they're either good or bad. They're just people are going to move on out of that school or out of that organization for these kinds of reasons. Some people say, well, maybe this is higher in teaching because teaching is predominantly female, and so females often want to have a family, et cetera. And, but we don't really know that it's higher in teaching. We don't really know that. People, that's a hypothesis. The bottom two bars are the ones that really interest me as a researcher. I departed my school because I wanted to pursue another or better job. That's the fourth one. And then finally, note the longest bar of all. Over 55%. I departed that school because I was dissatisfied with it. If I combine these two bottom bars, they account for well over half of the large flows of teachers out of schools each and every year. That's important. That's important. Dissatisfaction is the longest bar. Over half of the large flows, teachers are telling us that they did so because they were dissatisfied. But dissatisfied with what? What in particular? I'm a former high school teacher. There was a lot of gripes. Now, back then, we had these, you could smoke cigarettes. And back then, the staff room would be full of smoke. <laughs> You'd go in during your one period off during the day, and it'd be, you know, you're hoping everyone would smoke less. And, but it was all full of gripes. I'm not putting this down. We had a lot, you know, you'd sort of vent. And there was a lot of gripes. They're all over the map. And when I first started doing this research, I thought, gosh, there's a lot of sources of dissatisfaction. 
Again, this is across the nation. This is a large sample. Interestingly enough, no. That certain types of complaints and sources of dissatisfaction consistently rise to the top of the data. We've done analyzed these data over different years at different times. And so of that 55% dissatisfied, here were their major sources of dissatisfaction. And again, I apologize if those in the back can't see, the font's too small. All right. The longest one here, dissatisfied with testing and accountability. That's a huge factor. And these data are from the 2012-2013 school year. So they're several years old, but that was a, uh, and so uh, No Child Left Behind Act was still in effect. And that's a huge source of dissatisfaction here, over 60%. The second one, dissatisfied with administration. Now, this one's a little too vague for me. What about the administration? Are you This doesn't really help me much. But this is, you know, when you work with large-scale database where the questionnaire has already long since been written and administered to the teachers, you're, you're stuck with, with what it is. The next one, the third one. Lack of influence and autonomy, over 50%. This has to do with how much input and voice do the teachers have into the key decisions in the building that affect their jobs. This is a long-standing issue. The term often used these days is teacher leadership, but it used to be site-based management and teacher empowerment and teacher decision-making. It's a long-standing concern and complaint that, gosh, I'm a teacher, and I have to implement all these policies that are often silly, but they're made up in the state capital or central district headquarters, and I have no voice, and why didn't someone ask me? I could have told them that, you know, this is a good idea, but it doesn't have a hope of working kind of complaint. Very common complaints from teachers, the whole issue of voice, and then coupled with it is how much discretion and autonomy do I have in the classroom? This is, the latter's been a growing complaint because of the increase in standardized curricula uh, that often limit the discretion and leeway of teachers. By the way, this whole issue of voice and, and influence and decision making, of course, is one of the hallmarks of the professions. The idea is that the professions, you know, architecture and medicine and law and academia and engineering, dentistry, et cetera, these, these require expertise, and that you uh, that the professionals should have should have a lot of discretion, a lot of voice, a lot of authority in the key decisions. That's the argument made. They're the experts. And the criticism here is that teachers don't have that often, and this has been a major complaint. I'm going to return to this one later. It turns out this varies a lot between schools. Classroom intrusions is the next one. Interruptions in my teaching while I'm in the classroom. Student discipline problems, 48 some percent. Well, I was giving a talk to some legislators and one of the representatives raised his hand and said, well, Professor Ingersoll, this is not really helpful. So, okay, the data tell us that where there's student discipline problems, there's more teacher turnover. I mean, okay, I get it, but Professor Ingersoll, this doesn't, this isn't really helpful. I mean, it's sort of a no-brainer. And then he went on a little bit and he said, look, isn't it just a fact of life that unfortunately part of the teaching job these days is putting up with a certain amount of verbal abuse and maybe nonverbal abuse? And it's unfortunate, but what can we do about that, Professor Ingersoll? I mean, after a look at the television, and there's a decline in respect for authority, and okay, it makes teachers quit more. Can we move on, Professor Ingersoll? This is just not, you know, I mean, what do you suggest we do, Professor Ingersoll? Okay, what do I suggest? I'm thinking quickly, you know, you only have very short leash when you're with legislators. It's very, you have to be very quick, otherwise you lose your chance. So, I said, because I remembered this, that look, it turns out, the data tell us, that schools vary dramatically 
in how much problems they have with student behavior and discipline. There's very large school-to-school -school differences in the extent of these problems. Some schools do a far better job of coping with them than do other schools. And poverty is by no means the only factor here. And those schools that do a better job of coping with their student discipline behavioral issues have significantly better teacher retention. So no, uh, Congressman, we don't need to throw up our hands and say we can't, there's nothing we can do. Why don't we look at those places? Let's go to ur tough urban schools that seem to have a really good handle. You know, enlightened management, they figured out how to handle challenging student behavioral discipline issues. Let's see what they're doing and see if we can replicate that. So in other words, we don't just have to throw up our hands, but because these are reasons teachers give doesn't necessarily mean they'd be easy to fix. Poor facilities and resources on down. Class size is too large is at the bottom. It's just under a third. Now that's important because class size reduction is expensive. What you'll notice as we go through these that fixing some of these would cost a lot of money and fixing some of these wouldn't cost much money and that's important. So Salaries and benefits is just under a third there towards the bottom. In other words, that's not the main source of dissatisfaction, at least across the nation. Again, I can't speak for teachers in Kansas. I do not know your teacher salary schedule. I know I was talking to uh, people in South Dakota a couple years ago, and they realized that their state Pay, their teacher salaries were lower than all the surrounding states and that actually they'd had an outflow, sort of a brain drain of teachers and they, the, the uh, governor decided to raise the salaries. I can't speak to Kansas, but it's, it's a factor here, but it's not the main source of dissatisfaction. That's very important. Think back. This is the nation's largest occupation. There's four million some teachers. If we raise all the teachers' salaries just a few thousand bucks, it becomes a very big ticket item. I'm not making an argument again. I'm a former teacher. I'd like to raise teachers' salaries. But one needs to take a deep breath and figure out how one's going to pay for that. So sometimes I'll just have, like, if it's legislators, they might just preface it by saying, OK, Professor Ingersoll, I want to hear everything, but just don't bring up salaries. We can't go there. OK. Yes. I remember years ago at one point Bill Clinton, when he was president, gave some speeches in which he said he wanted to raise all the teacher salaries across the country. And then that went away. I never heard him give that speech again. <laughs> I don't know, but I did have a hypothesis as to why he didn't give any more speeches on that, that maybe he sat down with the accountants and the budget people and they added it up and thought, oh, wow, this is going to be expensive. I don't know. But one of the interesting things from these data is that salaries is not the main thing. It's not the only thing. So let's go back to that conventional wisdom that we make too few teachers and we need to recruit more in. This is a very common sort of thing. And many of the last few presidents made initiatives along these lines, including President Obama, his famous 100K in 10, which he introduced in 2010. And this was focusing on math science in particular. And the idea was that each year, uh, we want to recruit 10,000 new math science teachers. And so after a decade, that's 100,000. A wonderful idea. Who could be against recruiting bright, math science majors in college to come into teaching. A wonderful notion, and very similar to the kinds of initiatives that prior presidents had done, including Clinton and Bush. But let's look at what the data tell us. That between 2008 and 2009 alone, over 30,000 math science teachers left. This isn't move between schools. This is left. So you want to bring in 10,000 a year, but each year you're losing over 30,000. Of them, over, just over 10,000 did, did left because of retirement. Double that number, over 20,000 left because of dissatisfaction. <clears throat> uh, 
The president's initiative alone just won't do it when you look at these data. Another 28,000 moved to other schools. Of course, they're still in the system. They're just not in those schools they left. <coughs> the image that always comes to mind here for me is the leaky bucket. We just have to keep pouring water into that bucket just to stay even because there's these holes in the bottom. There is nothing wrong with the president's recruitment initiatives, of course, nor any other recruit teacher recruitment initiatives. They're good, but they alone won't do it. If we lose 40 to 50% of our new hires within five years, we not only haven't solved the problem, we've lost the investment. So the president, the last I heard, $60 million was spent on this. We lose that investment. So what could we possibly do? What concrete things could we do to plug some of the, to take some mud and plug some of the holes in the bottom of that bucket to slow down some of the turnover? And I'm going to briefly talk about three different types of initiatives. I've done research on myself that I think we have strong data showing work. The first has to do with a project where I just got asked again and again and again, well, Richard, does the depth and type and amount and breadth of pre-service, pre-employment teacher preparation, does that have any bearing on retention and turnover? You know, does the, does the way some ed schools prepare teachers better than ed, other ed schools in terms of retaining them? So again, looking at national data, and we did this whole analysis. And we looked at all the type of preparation education people had before they taught, and then we looked at how many were gone after just one year. That's what the data allowed us to do. And what we found out is, yes, pre-service teacher preparation does have a bearing on retention, but it depends on what you're looking at. Some things have a bearing, and some, some things are correlated, and some things aren't. So these were advanced statistical analyses where we're holding constant the characteristics of the teacher, you know, male, female, and race, ethnicity, and age, and we're holding constant, controlling for the characteristics of schools that they get a job in, you know, poverty, size, public, private, etc. Holding all that constant, does the pre-service prep, pre prep correlated at all? Well, it turns out, here's what's not correlated. Whether you got an education degree or an academic degree, you know, whether it was in in uh, elementary ed or science ed versus it was in math or history. That didn't seem to line up. How prestigious or the type of college or university you went to, that wasn't correlated. Whether you went to a traditional program or an alternative program, that wasn't correlated. None of those things seem to have a bearing on retention. Here's what did have a bearing and a strong bearing. The kinds of methods and pedagogical preparation you did or didn't have before you taught in the preparation program. It didn't matter whether it was called traditional alternative. What did matter was kind of the meat, what you got, what you got. If you got coursework and teaching methods, you had less attrition. Again, this is controlling for type of school and all that. The strongest one of all, and to me this seems a little bit like a no-brainer, was practice teaching. If you had some student practice teaching ahead of time, you had better durability once on the job. Now, this might seem like a no-brainer, but the data also showed us, I was a little bit stunned to see this, was that over a fifth of the first-year teachers in this country never had any student of practice teaching. Their first day in the job was the first day in front of kids. And, 40% of them were gone after just one year. If you never had any student of practice teaching, nationally 40% of that group were gone after just one year. Preparation and selecting course materials, coursework in child psych or learning theory, formal feedback, formal feedback on teaching, all of these were correlated with better retention. Now it's interesting, you know, colleges and schools of education, there's a great deal of ferment and criticism surrounding them that's been going over the last decade. And then there's all kinds of different models, and there's a lot of innovation, and there's 
trying out different ways of making a teacher. And one of the things that's often derided by the critics of schools of education and of teacher certification is pedagogy. I mean, I have colleagues where pedagogy, that's a bad word. And they use words like gobbledygook. Oh, what's all this pedagogical gobbledygook they give these teachers? All you need, Richard, is just to have an academic degree in math, and then you can be a high school math teacher, or a degree in English, and you can be an English teacher. Typically, these are people that have never actually taught in high school. And I have to explain that, look, you could have a PhD in math, but it's not so easy to get across algebra to ninth and 10th graders having tried that a couple points in my teaching career. So in any event, what these data tell us is that if we want to look at improving retention, we can look at our teacher preparation programs. All right, a second type of initiative. Once on the job, how much support do we provide for the new teachers, the beginning teachers? Induction is often the term used. Again, I'm not quite sure what Kansas has, but many, many states and districts have induction support programs for beginning teachers. Often having a veteran teacher serve as a mentor is a key, is a key thing done. And this has been a growth over the last couple of decades. The percentage of beginning teachers that get some kind of support has grown dramatically. When I was a teacher, it was called sink or swim. Principal gave you the, uh, principal gave you the keys to your classroom, gave you a pat in the back, and said good luck, and that was it. Uh, I never knew what the word induction meant. And if you wanted a mentor, you had to sort of plead with someone after school, could you ask them some questions? There just wasn't any kind of um, structured program. You, you were really on your own. And there was a certain pride in that. You know, if you can make it on your own, you can really be a good teacher. And Yeah, OK. At any event, there's been a growth in support programs. And here's what they, here's what they typically entail. The most common thing is actually to have some contact, some talk time with your principal or vice principal, which might seem sort of funny, but I don't think I ever met with my principal when I was a high school teacher. I, I don't remember, but it wasn't, there wasn't much. Well, now that's a common thing. Second most common is a veteran teacher is assigned to be your mentor. Third, some kind of seminars, maybe the district office offers these for beginning teachers, sort of here's the ropes, here's the system. A very important one is structured common planning time with colleagues in your own department or your own grade level. That's an important one, it turns out. And not ad hoc, where it's structured, it's built in. The beginning teacher meets with their colleagues teaching the same stuff. Uh, less common is having an aide in the classroom, and very uncommon is having a reduced teaching load. So these are the kinds of things that across the nation are supplied to beginning teachers. And so this brings up an important question. Well, do they, do they work? Do they make any difference? And I got asked if several years ago this question by a group called Education Commission of the States that represents the 50 states. And they said, look, a lot of districts and states are spending money on these programs. And Richard, could you do a review and see if there's any research out there that actually shows any effects, positive or negative? Because the states are clamoring for evidence one way or the other before they continue to spend money on these programs. We did a whole review, and we found 15 studies that seemed to be at least somewhat solid from a research and science viewpoint. And we didn't know what to expect when we looked at this. What we were going to find, we expected sort of to find very mixed some study so positive effects, some so negative. Gosh, what do you make of that? And one of the things that was interesting to us was we found that almost all the studies showed positive effects. That's unusual. If you look at anything, charter schools, does the research show they're good or bad? It's always mixed. It's very frustrating. Most of the research showed positive effects on three different outcomes, retention of beginning teachers, how well they taught in the classroom, and most importantly, student achievement. So we have strong empirical evidence showing that support programs for beginning teachers work. That's important because they're not cost free. But the other thing we found out in this re careful review of the studies out there is that 
what teachers get varies a whole lot. <sighs> For instance, a mentorship could be a 20-minute cup of coffee in September with the, vet, with the mentor teacher, and that's it. All the way over to a highly thought through structured program where the mentor teacher is given some time off, they may be given some training, they might be given a stipend, they meet regularly with the mentee, the beginning teacher, they give them feedback, it's done on a regular, I mean really, how, there's a whole range. And the data seem to suggest, it's kind of a common sense finding, that you get what you pay for. The more thorough, thought through induction programs, and also those that lasted more than one year, that seemed to be important, had far better results than the thinner programs. The more, the more thorough ones also cost more. So that's a second sort of line of research we've done on something that can, be, that can help teacher retention. A third one, and this is a project we've just finished, the report. And I mentioned this earlier. Remember, under those reasons behind dissatisfaction, lack of input into decision-making and voice was a big source of dissatisfaction. So there's a whole movement. These days, the term teacher leadership is used. How much say do teachers have, particularly beyond the classroom decisions in the building? There's a couple states now that have actually mandated all schools, I think this is North Carolina, Colorado, and Oregon, I think, mandated that there be a school improvement team or a council in each school, that the majority on the team be teachers. Administrators are also on there, of course. And that it's not simply be advisory. It actually have decision-making power. That's a very interesting reform. Teacher leadership is the term often used. And so one question is, well, if you give teachers more say, particularly in beyond the classroom decisions, does it make any difference? I mean, maybe it's a good thing, and it professionalizes teachers, and it might reduce uh, turnover. But you know, let's, let's do some solid research to see, does it actually line up with outcomes? And we did. We got a large uh, database, 25,000 schools across 16 states. <coughs> One of the things we learned was that schools vary dramatically in how much input teachers have. It's interesting. They vary a lot. And it turns out it does make a difference. It was strongly lined up. So schools in which teachers had more input in decision making, controlling for everything else, you know, poverty of the school and all that stuff, size of the school, their students scored significantly better on the state tests in both math and English language arts. It was a strong finding. I was quite taken with that. What a, what a piece of ammunition for teacher leadership reforms, which you, you know, may or may not be in favor of, but we have this data. Now remember, this is in, an, this is in a context of accountability. You're holding the teachers accountable, but you're not necessarily micromanaging them from on high, telling them how to get from A to B. They have a big voice in that. But it's not run amok in a sense. It's, it's, there's accountability. There's a whole movement now towards teacher-led schools, uh, particularly in the northern Midwest, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Often they're charter schools where teachers run them, and they call themselves partnership schools, and they've been explicitly modeled after law and engineering partnerships where the partners, the professionals, they own and run the firm. And they're accountable. If the firm goes under, it's their fault kind of thing. And these teachers, they do not have an administrator who's a boss. They, ha they obviously have a bunch of functions that need to get done, and they may hire that out. The teachers, as a group, a committee, like the head committee in a law firm, they run the opera. It's a very interesting model. It's a small number of schools, but it's a growing number. I'd like to get some research and see, well, what's, what's the, what, is that, what does that do, if anything? So those are the three initiatives, kinds of initiatives that we've done research on that we found up line up with positive effects on retention. So it's, it's pre-service, particularly practice teaching. It's support in those first few years, and it's this whole issue of teacher leadership. So let me just finish, close here with the, the bottom line. If we want to ensure that we have a qualified class, a teacher in front of every classroom, 
I think the data tell us we need to improve retention, and that's the theme of your summit. We need to cut turnover. And if we want to do that, we can work on some of these conditions in schools and also our preparation ahead of time. Those can really help. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for question and answer, if anyone has any. And I guess you'll need, yes. Did, did you start at the beginning and say that you had extrapolated this data by state as well, or not? Some? Some, not these particular data. I, lots of times I'll be asked, and I'll break things down by 50, 50 states. For these indicators, I haven't. It could be done. And the, the same slides for Kansas could be generated. Almost every one of these, there's going to be enough in the sample to the Kansas picture, which would be interesting. I don't know. Is Kansas similar or different? Yes. You might have said it, I missed it, but did you do look at the data by um, grade level or subjects? Like, do we, have, do we have more teachers leaving that are in middle school versus first or second grade? All right. The question had to do with um, teacher to teacher and school to school differences in turnover rates, I think. And yes, we've looked at that a lot. And Yes, there's some differences across types of teachers. So for instance, uh, teachers from racial ethnic minorities turn over at distinctly higher rates than do non-minority teachers. That's a big issue. Not much differences between male and female teachers. Some, but not huge differences between teachers in different fields, math, science versus English versus social studies. Special ed's a little high on its turnover. Uh, there are some differences between high school, middle school, and elementary, and there are some state-to-state -state differences. So we've, we've done what's called disaggregation. There's lots of differences, but the really big ones are these school-to-school -school differences. These sort of trump all the others. And as far as teachers go, the really big ones are the experience issue. The beginners quit at the highest rates of all. Did that answer? Yes. So yes, there's some differences across teachers and schools, but the big ones are these. Beginners and the urban poor schools. Yes. Other questions? Or... Yes, in the back. Great to see you. Uh, dispatch measures. Uh, you mentioned that there's no way to indicate which one was the dominant one for teachers because salary was low on that list. And yet, when you show the math science slide, you had as many teachers moving schools to poor schools to rich schools to spend more money. Yes. Than, than, than they had actually made. So I think salary is more important than you make. Than, than perhaps that's my view. Good question. It has to do with the relative importance of salary behind that decision whether to stay or leave. and. If there's this big flow from poor to not poor, doesn't that suggest salaries is an issue? You're right, salaries is an issue. But a lot of that flow from poor to not poor isn't just salaries, it's things like the whole voice issue, autonomy in the classroom. At least in the East, uh, the urban, lar large urban school districts have become very top down. And for instance, the high rates of turnover amongst black teachers, for instance, black African-American teachers, the biggest correlate, it's not salaries, it's decrease in leeway and discretion in the classroom. That's a huge gripe. And so I don't know what to say. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I can't say salaries aren't important, but they don't seem to be the biggest one. And also, they're, they're one of the most expensive ones to fix. Here and here and here. Uh, yes, sorry. So, so your focus of your talk appropriately so is on retention. <clears throat> yes. And, uh, you identified some key factors which were very fascinating. So, so can you switch a little bit to recruitment? Uh, um, so you're going to talk to a middle school child. Or you're going to talk to the parents of a middle school child who's interested in being a teacher, but the parents are not. Yeah. Can you yeah. change their thinking? Their <laughs> How can we get the parents 
to want their bright high schooler to, to consider teaching as a viable line of work. Well, the, the, the student, the child, is considering being a teacher. But the parents don't like it. In other words, maybe the parents either don't respect teaching and don't want that for their child, or they fear that it's not well paid and those types of things. Well, you know what I'm going to say is that well-paid, well-respected lines of work with good working conditions do not suffer from shortages. They have waiting lists. There's long waiting lists to get into the law school. And, you know, quite often the, the way, the standard practice to increase recruitment is often widen the gate, lower the bar. Make it easier to get in. There's all these burdens. You have to get teacher certification. Well, actually, compared to other lines of work, teaching is one of the easiest ones to get in. I mean, look at law. You've got to go to three years of law school and then pass the bar exam. But again, that doesn't dissuade lots of people that want to become lawyers. Why? Well, the standard explanation is it's well-paid, well-respected work, often, with good working conditions. So if we could do those things, it would improve both recruitment and retention. <laughs> I'm not saying any of that's easy. And the money stuff is expensive. We're just coming out of a recession, or I hope we are. So, yes. But some of these things, I mean, for instance, the whole uh, induction support for beginning teachers, that's both a recruitment and a retention device. You know, savvy applicants, when they're in an interview, they'll say, well, do you have any kind of support induction mentoring program for beginning teachers? If I took a job here, would there be any kind of, you know, help me learning the ropes? So that's a recruitment mechanism, too. As far as changing the parents' minds, I'm not quite sure how to do that. Let's see, there was, there was one over here and one here. Yes? So I'm looking at your particular sources of dissatisfaction, and I'm looking at many of them are state or federally mandated, or they're governed by some sort of regulation. And I'm curious about the numbers within the teaching profession, how they might relate or not relate to other industries or that are also highly regulated by federal law, state law, social regulation. Are you specifically asking about levels of dissatisfaction, levels of dissatisfaction cross-occupational, cross-profession data? Specifically related to highly regulated. <laughs> yes. Does that, does that exist? Let me know if you find such data. We, c we can get data on turnover rates across different lines of work. But drilling down and getting data on the reasons for turnover. Many of these things are not the sole control. Of yes. Yes, a bunch of these, a principal has no control over these, yes. So that's why I'm curious about whether maybe people in other regulated industries are dissatisfied in general, or if they're going to be teaching well, we do have some data on levels of satisfaction overall, cross-occupation. I mean, teaching, there's a funny thing where you, people like it. They'll say positive things about their choice to become a teacher. But it also has high quit rates. There's both of those. But I don't actually know of data where we can, I could take this slide and line it up with different lines of work. Oh, I'd love such data. That would be very interesting. There's a question here and one here. I, just an observation. When I look at dissatisfaction with administration, it, it appears to me that several of those other factors would be related to that, like yes. autonomy, class and treatment, yes. discipline. So did you look at those distinctly as different categories, or do they all kind of relate together? They do relate. A lot of these, and they're correlated, too. These are just simply how the questions in the questionnaire broke them out. But certainly, that dissatisfied administration overlaps with a bunch of the others. I mean, in general, these things point to me to the power and importance of management and leadership. Now, having said that, though, that the point over here, which is that you know a lot of this is out of the hands, certainly of school level, but even district level administrators. But in general, my research always points me towards leadership and management are really important. I mean, the whole voice issue for teachers. And we see that schools vary dramatically in how much voice teachers have. So they vary. 
In some places, teachers have a real say. And by the way, there's downsides. There's, we have this in academia. When you have voice, you have long meetings. Because <laughs> we professors talk <laughs> a lot. So yes, a lot of them overlap. Uh, I think there was, yes. I understand in other nations, Respectful teaching is not as much of an issue as it seems to be in the United States. Have you considered the uh, analysis of other nations and how they perceive teaching and giving some suggestions on moving forward in the United States? You mentioned Canada? Yeah. We do have cross-national data that get at a bunch of these issues. And uh, for instance, the whole thing of sort of the respect and status of teaching and how it varies across different nations and societies. Yes, it varies a lot, and that's very interesting. It's clear that there's more than one way of skinning the cat. And I have looked at some of that. I did a trip and worked with some people from Singapore. I mean, that's just amazing. You had to be in the top of your college class to even be considered to be a teacher. <laughs> Teachers are very well paid and very, very well respected, and it's a top profession. And you know, the Singaporean students are always at the top of the international scores, those rankings. So there's different ways of doing it, yes. That always gives me hope. But, you know, since the public school system was founded, teaching was not treated as and considered to be a high status line of work. That was, that's the historical sort of bed we have. Uh, in the case of Singapore, they were able to remake themselves after World War II. And they thought it through, and they thought education is our thing, and we're going to make teaching important, and we're going to do, you know, we can do whatever we want. And they did. So yes, there's different ways of doing it, and it varies a lot. And the whole respect for teachers varies a lot. Let's see. There's one back here. Yes. Are you, it sounds like you're asking about the, the um, better retention rates and some of those other lines of work, and is there any research that gets at why that is? Because they spend so much more time in their prep with somebody right beside them. That should certainly be a factor that, you know, the idea of providing some support in an induction is pretty common across, you know, doctors have their internships, etc. Well, what I'm asking is, is there research around schools that do that, that partners? Is there research around... Yeah. Are there any partners that, that pair teachers that way? That you Okay. Elementary and secondary schools that provide a lot of support like some of the professions do? Was that the question? Because I... Yeah, it's a pilot. I'm spending hundreds of hours with a pilot next to me before I actually take off and do it myself. We have prep partners that do that. And if so, what's the research on keeping those teachers? Well, we do have research on the positive effects of induction and mentoring for beginning teachers. Now, maybe you're asking about partners and coaches and things like that. There is some research on that. First, I thought you were asking, do we have research in some of these other lines of work, like pilots or lawyers or doctors? And there probably is, but I don't know a lot of that. I know some on nursing, for instance. But there is research on and teaching on does coaching, does having a coach assigned to you? I, Oh, uh, four years of student teaching. Or whatever. I don't know of such research, but I don't think I'm answering very well, and I couldn't hear all of it. But I, I, I don't, I don't think we have that. I don't know of that kind of research. No. One in the back here. Although the, I think I'm going to get the hook pretty soon. But <laughs> go ahead. Does your research include educational support staff? 
So maybe not classroom teachers, but um, educators who are outside the classroom. This particular database has uh, focuses on teachers. And you have to, that it needs to be your primary job in the school to be included in the database. So it's up teachers. So it doesn't include all the support staff. Uh, there's also a questionnaire given to principals and building level administrators. So no, we don't have that. And that'd be an important area to study. Uh, the non-classroom non teaching support staff. Debbie Dweck, should I do one more? <laughs> yes, I'm, yes. It looks like we're just trying to wear you out, but it's going to be because of our interest. So I try to make my question short. So I look at your data, which is extensive. Um, uh, mainly it's public school teachers. So how do you think these data are comparable or even translatable to teachers working in private or parochial schools? Yes, a lot of the data today were public, not all. And we certainly have done lots of comparisons of private and public, because of course that's a huge debate. And there's certainly a camp out there that argues that private is better, private is superior. The teaching job, they will argue, is better in private schools. The data are quite mixed on that. Uh, private schools overall actually have higher turnover than public. But the big thing to remember about private is the variations. There isn't really one private sector in schooling. There's huge variations from you know, very high turnover, very low turnover, and all those different indicators. So there's very big differences there uh, amongst the private schools. The same thing goes for charter schools too, by the way. Huge variations, which we'd expect. You, know, you're, you have less regulation, and so you can do things a little differently, and they do. In the case of charters, it's sort of the window of innovation, and so we have good innovations and bad innovations going on. And the same thing with private, in a sense, of course, private need to keep the tuition coming, and otherwise they're going to disappear. So, you know, there's big differences in the teaching job across private and public, both pro and con. The pay is generally lower, and the turnover is higher, but big variations. Thank you. <laughs>